is today. We're very lucky to be joined by Bill Baruki from NASA Ames. Uh, and Bill is the uh, principal investigator and leader of the Kepler mission. Uh, Bill did a, a bachelor's of, in physics at the University of Wisconsin and also a, a master's in physics at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then he did a, um, also a master's in um, meteorology at California State uh, University in San Jose. Uh, he's worked at NASA Ames uh, since 1962 and in uh, the decade when he joined NASA Ames he worked on uh, lab and theoretical studies of uh, the radiation environment surrounding uh, re-entry vehicles uh, and he developed uh, spectroscopic uh, techniques for looking at uh, the plasma generated by hypervelocity shock models, shock waves uh, from uh, re-entry vehicles. Uh, he, he then uh, worked on uh, photochemical models of the stratosphere, the terrestrial stratosphere and mesosphere uh, looking at uh, nitric acid and uh, and, uh, and fluorocarbons and their effect on ozone. Uh, and uh, he's also very interested in lightning on planetary, in planetary atmospheres uh, and has uh, developed optical instruments uh, for looking at the coupling of laser-induced plasmas uh, in atmospheres uh, simulating lightning. But uh, the reason for uh, his talk today uh, and uh, a great deal of his career uh, has been uh, supporting uh, the concept of looking at transiting exoplanets. In 1984 and 1998, he led workshops uh, looking at promising methods for looking at transiting exoplanets. And so it's really been uh, a, uh, the last 30 years, 35 years of his career, uh, where he's led efforts uh, to prove the technologies that have eventually ended up in the Kepler mission, uh, which has been so successful today. Uh, and he also uh, has been uh, instrumental in uh, proving, as he'll, I'm sure he'll talk about in his talk, improving uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sensitivity of front and back illuminated uh, CCDs uh, and proving that they had the required sensitivity to detect exoplanets and uh, thus enabling uh, the uh, Kepler mission. So I'm sure we're going to hear about that in more detail and with more expertise from Bill. So please uh, join me in welcoming Bill. Thank you, Adrian. Well, I want to talk about the, the Kepler mission tonight and uh, where we're at presently, uh, how we got there, and what I expect in the coming years as Kepler uh, finishes up. Basically, Kepler is the next step in our exploration for life in our galaxy. It um, is designed to find the frequency of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of stars uh, like the Sun. We want to know, in some sense, eta sub Earth. What's that term in the Drake equation? But also, specifically, we'd like to understand the distribution of planet sizes. How many are small like the Earth, twice the size of the Earth, whatever. We'd like to understand uh, their orbital distributions, orbital periods, similar major axis, and ultimately to associate what we find with the kind of stars they orbit. Because stars come through, come in a huge variety of sizes and temperatures and ages and compositions. I'd like to start out, though, when I, when I talk about this, is sort of a sketch of what planetary systems, uh, how they develop. And they sort of frame our ideas of what we're looking for. What we have here is a, uh, a picture, an uh, artist's conception of the formation of a planetary system. We know in our galaxy there are large giant molecular clouds. Some of them uh, have condensed. Uh, as they do so, there's a collapse. Angular momentum is conserved. The accretion disk spins. It's full of uh, gas and dust. And uh, as it flattens out, the material flows toward the star forms a central star. Further out, uh, you see some uh, concentrations. Those are the planets. And in fact, if you look, one of the things they show here is a planet is uh, absorbing or taking into uh, uh, the material from that disk to build itself. Now, this picture sort of explains a lot of what we know about our own solar system. All the planets go in the same direction, prograde. Spin axis, essentially aligned with the star, with the uh, accretion disk. So this explains much of that. Another thing that you can imagine is that if you're close, your planet close to the star, 
The only, it's so hot. The only thing that could condense are the refractory materials. So that explains why you've got Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars, and then several AU out, several distances of the Earth out. It's colder, and you can form the giant planets. They form, they've got this large distance, they can go around, they pick up all this material, and they get massive enough so they can attract the hydrogen and helium and form a giant planet. It's a great concept. It doesn't work all that well, but it's a great place to start. <laughs> and this is what we thought when we went out and they built the technology that allowed us to go and check these, these theories and this idea. One of the things that we found, of course, is that we saw lots of Jupiters right immediately. And that Jupiters weren't out at five AUs. They didn't have an orbital period of 12 years. They had an orbital period of four days. They're inside the orbit of Earth, Venus, inside the orbit of uh, Mercury. Very, very short periods. And that was a big surprise. And we continued with ground-based systems to find those. And so we need to explain that. And this is a mathematical approach to trying to explain it. What you see is a disk around the star. You can't see the star. It's not in the, in the computation. Its gravitational field is, but it's not there. And what you see, in fact, is this red region, which is a portion of the accretion disk. In the center of that disk, you see a little object, and that's a planet forming. So we're going to do a mathematical calculation of how the planet form affects the disk and how the disk affects the planet. And so what you're seeing here is this planet moving through the disk, and as it does so, it is more massive, is more dense than the disk itself. And consequently, it moves faster than the material around it. Now, what that means is it's going through this disk, it's going through a fluid, and it's leaving a wave. And that wave is shown here. You can see it behind and in front of the planet. If we had a, a motorboat going across a lake, it too would make a wave. As long as the motor runs, that wave is there. You shut the motor off, the wave has been extracting energy and momentum. There's none left. It stops. So as long as it goes through that fluid, it's generating a wave. It's losing momentum, and it's losing energy to the disk. It doesn't have a motor. And consequently, it's getting its energy from potential energy, and it's falling into the star. It's migrating into the star. And this is the reason we are seeing these giant planets come in toward their star. The question is, well, what stops them? Why don't they all fall into the star? Of course, many of them may fall into the star. We won't know about that. But we certainly see a lot of these that haven't fallen into the star. So we want to explain that. Now, one of the things you can imagine is that at some point, the star, which is accreting, it's building up, it's getting hotter. Finally, a fusion occurs. The system becomes fully luminous, blows the dust and gas away, and that's gone. Well, if it's gone, this planet is no longer moving through a fluid. It's no longer generating a wave. It's no longer losing energy and momentum, so it's in a nice stable orbit. So that is how uh, people like to uh, explain what they see, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go, we, we go on. We also need to mention the habitable zone. I'm not going to spend more than a moment on it because I'm sure you've heard about it many, many times. But here the habitable zone is shown in green. So the blue represents two, two coals. If you're too far away from the, from the star, the oceans are frozen, uh, if you're in a red zone, you're too close, the oceans have boiled off, and you're trying to find the habitable zone, which is somewhere between the fire and the ice, where you can have water, where you might uh, expect to evolve life. And that zone here is quite wide if you're talking about uh, massive stars, but it's tucked into small stars. And the implication here is that in short periods, if you're talking about planets in short period orbits, the habitable zone, they're around the small stars. But if you say, I've got a, a planet in habitable zone around a hot star, it's going to take several years to go around once. And we're going to talk about the fact we need to see several transits. Looks like there's a question. Can you hold off to the end, or do you need to have, have it answered right now? OK, because I'd, I'd like to sort of cover all these topics. And if you keep your question, I'm happy to go back through it and answer questions. But otherwise, you get halfway through. and doesn't work. So let's go on. There's lots of ways to find planets. Uh, the way that doesn't work is look at the star, see if you can see the planet. The star is too bright. It overwhelms you with light. So what you do instead is say, I'm going to look at the starlight and use the change in starlight because there's a planet to deduce the properties of the planet. If the star wiggles back and forth, 
you can do astrometry. If it's moving back and forth toward you, you can get radial velocity. What we do here is to look for the planet across the star and dim the light from the star. The amount of dimming tells you the size of the planet. The orbital period causes rep repetition of dimming, and that's the transit method. That's the method Kepler uses. What we show here is uh, the Earth relative to a star. We've got to watch this little planet go across that star, and we don't see the star as such. We see a dot. We're just going to see it dim, and you can see this star is going to be quite variable. That big piece that comes out of it is a solar, maximum eje uh, solar mass ejection event, the sort of thing that causes the uh, magnetic uh, storms that we have on Earth when it hits the Earth. So we're going to, to be successful, we're going to have to do, try every trick we can to reduce the noise of the system, and then we're still going to have to dig that little signal out of what's left of the noise. And so you'll see uh, that next. First thing you do, put ultraviolet filter on, get rid of the ultraviolet. Now this star looks familiar. It's our sun, of course. And the little blue dot is the size of the Earth. The black dots are the uh, uh, sunspots. You can see some of the sunspots are bigger than the Earth. You have plages, the bright areas to the right. They, too, introduce noise and variability to the star. And so we're going to have to pick that out among that noise. And what helps us is that the spots and the plages are attached to the star. They're part of the star. They rotate across the star over periods of weeks, generally. The planet moves across very rapidly. In a few hours, it's going to cross. And it's extremely uh, repetitious. The orbital period that, that it shows is usually good to a part in 100,000. Spots come and go when they feel like it. And consequently, you're looking for something that's very repetitive, but you better find at least three. If that gives you the orbital period twice, it should agree one with another to a part per 100,000. Uh, for finding Earth, planets like the Earth, you often need quite a few more than that, particularly if the stars are noisier than expected, and they are. Okay, here's some data from the, uh, uh, our, our sun. It's data that was taken before we launched. This was data that we used to prove that this mission would work. And what we see here are uh, four different times. We've measured the brightness of the sun over, uh, uh, over some 250 days. We've done it four times. And what I've done is I've taken that data and I've subtracted a little bit of the brightness of the star that would be for the change that would occur if Earth had gone across the star at that time. So that's what we're looking for. That's the transit we're trying to find. Now, if you saw one of those, most of it would say it's noise, and most of the time you'd be right. But if you saw it repeat time and time again, next time it was there, next time it was there, and again it was there, always same duration, always same depth, uh, one of the things that you, you know, that would help convince you, and of course, by adding these, da these data uh, together, the noise is adding here, and the square root of the number of measurements you've made, but the signal adds linearly. So the signal of the noise is growing strongly with the number of planets. So finally, if you add four of them, you get a very strong signal. Can't miss this object. This is obviously very interesting. Now, it could be a small star crossing a big star. It could be a binary star in a background. So this data tells us we've got something interesting, but we better check and make sure that we're not fooled. Now, it's easy to see this. It's easy to see you've got an event here that you want to investigate around this particular star. All you need to know ahead of time is what was the orbital period. And you need to know that for 150,000 stars. And we have no knowledge of that. So clearly, this is a problem for a computer. A computer is going to go and guess the period is 1.000 days, 1.001 days, and repeat this about 10 million times per star. So it's going to be done by supercomputers, clusters of computers, and the people who lead that effort at Ames are here at SETI. John Jenkins leads that effort. Uh, a lot of the people here work on that effort to run these computers, to develop these techniques, so we find these, these spikes, and they help us interpret what those spikes might mean. So it's nice to be here tonight and talk about that. So what does the instrument look like? Basically, it's your camcorder. It's exactly like your camcorder, except it's got a really big telescopic lens. And its detector is not the size of a fingernail. It's a square foot, and it costs a lot more. Uh, it's a wide field, field of view photometer, is what we like to call it. Uh, it can view 150,000 stars or more simultaneously. Uh, it can look for many years, and it has a precision, photometric precision, of 10 parts per million. 
You don't know anything to 10 parts per million. Your height, your weight, your age, nothing. So this is really quite a, quite a breakthrough, and it took a lot of convincing to convince people you could make such an instrument and it would work. It wouldn't embarrass NASA to send this into orbit and find it didn't work. And we'll talk about that. That's sort of the past that we'll talk about. So basically what this is going to do is it's going to look at one area of the sky. It's going to look at 150,000 stars in that area of the sky. Big field of view, 40,000 times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And it essentially doesn't blink. It's in a heliocentric orbit, so it doesn't orbit the Earth. It orbits the Sun. That means it can look at this set of stars 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So don't blink. Look for those transits. They only last a few hours. Don't miss them. The cadence is 30 minutes. So you're, at, you're getting exposures every six seconds. You add them up into 30 minute sums. And every month you send that down to the Earth. And we look at each of these stars to see over time has it changed brightness. We also send down some 512 stars with a one minute cadence. And those allow us to see the pulsations of the star. The pulsations of a star are very much like the seismic waves that travel through the Earth. We have an earthquake. Those seismic waves tell you what's under the ground, that there's a mantle, there's a core. How big is it? What are the densities? We do the same thing for the stars that we look at, and we can tell ages, and we can tell the size. The size is important because the transit just tells you the size of the planet compared to the size of the star. You need to determine the size of the star, too. And so this helps us do that. All the photometry is done on the ground. As I said, we have a big a supercomputer center at Ames. Many of the people in this institute work with us uh, in analyzing that data. But it's done on the ground. It's done in several different ways. And it's, the, it's available to the public. Any of you tonight could go get that data and hunt through the data in flying planets. Confirming them is a different story. So what we have here is the, uh, the camcorder, the instrument. It's, it's a, a Schmidt kind of telescope. Some of the amateurs here are familiar with those and have used them. It's got a corrector in front that looks like a lens, big mirror in back, light comes down here, bounces off the mirror, hits the detectors, the detectors uh, convert it, the electrons, to, or the photons to electrons, store that data, put it in a spacecraft, and send it to the ground. Below is the, uh, the square foot of the detectors. The focal plane is not flat, it's curved. It's so severely curved that we actually have to flatten the, 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 the images a little bit. And so the blue material here is all sapphire lens. This is a square foot of pure sapphire uh, to do this job. The other thing that's interesting is you see the little dots here. I don't know if you can see the dots or not. These are the fine guidance sensors. They hold it on target. They hold it so well on target that the major movement of this system is the fact that the sky changes shape because this thing is moving at some fraction of the speed of light. So when you go toward it, the sky shrinks. When you go away, the sky expands. And we have to compensate for that. OK, so we built the spacecraft. We built the instrument. It took some eight years to build this thing. And uh, it was launched in 2009 at night, a moonless night, perfectly black night. And a, just a beautiful situation. Here's the Delta II, one of the most reliable rockets uh, uh, the United States has ever built nine strap-on boosters, three stage, and up on the top here is our instruments, about the size of a VW bus inside there going out into space. It was just like a star being launched into the sky. It was just beautiful to watch this launch. We're just all excited. There were hundreds of us there who'd worked on this mission. Sometimes used to say it was the most exciting night of my life. My wife said that's not true. <laughs> in any case, it went into orbit. And it's uh, in a, uh, an orbit following the Earth. And that is to say, it's, goes, it's orbital period is 53 weeks, the Earth is 52. So every year it gets further and further behind, and we're going to have to reduce the data rate at some point. Uh, and we are, in fact, in do reducing the data rate. But the neat thing about this is that since it's got a 53 week orbit and the Earth has got a 52 week orbit, Earth will lap this spacecraft. 52 years from now, or really 49 years from now, it will be back near the Earth. And I'm expecting the young people who will be very capable and will still want to explore space will go up there, pick up this telescope, this historic telescope that's told us whether Earths are common or rare, and put it in Air and Space Museum. I wouldn't be surprised for, for me to see that these people are so capable 
they have an Air and Space Museum on the moon. So we'll see. OK, we have found thousands of planetary candidates. Uh, 2,300 by October, I think, we'll, we'll have them, that number of closer to 3,000. But of those, we want to distinguish those that we'd be able to confirm. We got a nice spike. All sorts of data show this is probably a planet, but you've got to do a confirmation. Measure the mass. Prove that there's no other star around that could imitate it. So there's a great deal of processing that goes on. We use the world's biggest telescopes and a lot of them to check these things out. These are about 65 that we have confirmed. Uh, the number is actually up to close to 100 today because as you probably heard on the, uh, uh, on the web, they picked up another 41, confirmed another 41 in the last couple of weeks, and yesterday they confirmed two more. So it's almost a daily occurrence. What we see here are the size of the planets compared to Jupiter or compared to Neptune, which is here somewhere, Neptune, and to Earth. Now everybody knows you can't have planets bigger than Jupiter. That's in the textbooks. Well, of course, we found lots of planets bigger than the Jupiter, and that was a surprise, as were many of the things we have found. The theorists, of course, are absolutely delighted because they've got new data, new, uh, new chance to develop their theories. And because it used to be that the idea was if you took Jupiter, which is you know, 11 times size of the Earth, 300 times the mass, and you threw something into it, a brick, some hydrogen, or something small like the Earth, it would just go in there and dissolve inside, and the Earth, Jupiter wouldn't get bigger we get denser. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying there are a lot of planets bigger than Jupiter. So we're trying to understand that. We're also seeing an awful lot of planets between the size of Jupiter and the size of Neptune and the size of Earth down here. And that's where most of them are. And now we're finding planets smaller than Earth. We're finding planets that are Mars size and smaller. But what I want to do at this point is talk about all the candidates. We can take all these candidates. And we know about 80% of them or maybe better will be proved to be planets. In some cases, we know that rate will be better than 99%. So we're going to talk about those for a moment. We talked about the fact that we want the size distribution of planets. And here is that based on our data as of February 27th. And that, that's not going to change a great deal. We'll have a new, some more data, but it's not going to change a great deal. And what you see is we are finding 200, almost 250 Earth-sized planets. There are a lot of Earths out there. Some 600 or so uh, super Earth size, plants about twice the size of the Earth. Might very well be able to live on those as well. You weigh about twice as much, but many of us have had our weight double in the last you know, number of years, so it's possible. In any case, uh, we are getting size distributions, and we'll talk about some distributions of orbital period as well. What we're most interested in is the habitable zone. What's in the habitable zone? What can we learn about that, those, those planets? The answer is, of course, what we, we are fi finding planets in the habitable zone, these candidates that we have to prove out. Uh, but they're also mostly around the small, dim, cool stars because we haven't looked long enough around planets or stars like the sun. We're there we need four, five, six, seven years before we're going to get the information we want. But this is around stars that are, that are stars and that are somewhat cooler and smaller than that of the sun. And what we're seeing is we're finding something in the order of 30 or 40 of these objects. Most of them are not the size of the Earth. They're bigger than the Earth. Uh, what we see in this figure is the uh, size relative to the Earth. So you see one is, size, is the Earth size, four is Neptune size, 11 is Jupiter size. And we're not seeing much in terms of exactly the size of the Earth. Although there's one under here, which we think is probably a false positive, but we're checking checking it. The Earth is shown here, and it's got a temperature of 255 Kelvin. That's not the surface of the Earth. We can't measure the surface of planets. We measure the atmosphere, if there is an atmosphere. And so what's below the atmosphere is generally warmer than that. But this is like that of the Earth, so we compare it to what the Earth is like. And what we're seeing is there are quite a few, but all sizes, including planets even bigger than Jupiter. Now, are we interested in planets bigger than Jupiter? If you went to Jupiter and jumped into Jupiter, you would dissolve. It's all hydrogen helium. It's a gas planet. And the answer is actually we are. Because Jupiter, our own Jupiter, has four large moons, some of them almost as big as Mercury, planet Mercury. So you can imagine these planets, these, these giant planets, having moons the size, say, of the Earth. 
very much like uh, Pandora and, and the movie Avatar. If they have atmospheres, and they got four moons with atmospheres, people live on these moons, they go visit relatives on one moon or another, they go shopping, they go on vacations. So they're all interesting to us. So each of these planets we're working on to try to confirm them to see if indeed are they, uh, uh, is there any life? And we're looking for moons on these as well. We have confirmed one other planets in the habitable zone. And this is Kepler 22b. It's about 2.4 times the size of the Earth. We don't know its composition yet. We're, we're trying to measure it. We suspect it's probably a mixture of rock and, and, and hydrogen helium and maybe water, maybe a lot of water on this planet. And so it's a possible uh, abode of life, but we don't know. We're trying to, as I say, get at the mass. And the ground-based telescopes, several of them, are looking at this to see if they can get the mass. And so you get the mass, you get the size, you get the density. If the density is five or six, it's like the Earth. If it's one or two, it's like uh, a gas giant. We have confirmed another planet in the habitable zone yesterday, and I'll talk about that shortly. What I want to talk about next is the distribution of uh, uh, orbital periods for these planets. And we've divided them into four groups. We've divided them into Earth size, super Earth, Neptune size, Jupiter size. And what you see is the number falls as you go to a larger and larger orbital period. That's another way of saying it, it falls as the semi major axis gets larger and larger, the distance from the star. We know if a, a planet is orbiting around a particular star, what's the chance? that it'll be aligned in your line of sight, so we'll see the transit. What's proportional to the size of the star, inversely, inversely proportional to the diameter of the orbit. And that gets smaller and smaller the further away you go from, from the star. So we expect these fall-offs here. These are quite expected, even if the number of planets doesn't change with distance. So this is not unexpected at all. Well, this is easily explained. What's not so easily explained are the peaks. Why is there a peak at three days? Peak at three days, three days, and three days, in every case. Well, let's think about the model that we talked about of the planetary system. So we see planets being formed, and they come migrating in. They're producing this wave, they're losing energy, they're falling into the star. What if, when they get close to the star, their orbital period is greater than the rotation period of the star? So the, the star is rotating very rapidly compared to the rotation of the orbital period of the planet. It's got a three-day period. That means it's raising a strong tide on the star, a strong tide on the planet, and that as long as the star is rotating rapidly, that tide can transfer momentum from the star to the planet and keep it from falling into the star. It can hold it in this parking orbit. At some point, the star lights up, blows away the dust and gas, no more wave, the planet's in the stable parking orbit. Great. You know, now you explain the peak. Well, if that's true, what about these guys? They're, they're even closer to the star. They're inside that three-day period. Some of them have orbital periods of a day. Some of them have orbital periods of less than a day. So one season, spring, summer, fall, one day, six hours apiece. So, but they're very hot, so you don't have to worry about uh, living there. Even the iron ones are molten. So. But the point is that we, we want to understand them. Why do we see these? And the answer seems to be, well, well, maybe they came spiraling in just before they struck the star, entered the atmosphere. The star lit up, blew away the dust and gas, no more wave, it's stable. It's possible. They were just lucky. Another possibility, and I think one that a lot of people feel is probably the answer, is the planet came into the stable orbit, parked there, the gas blew away, it's a nice stable orbit, except, of course, it's not stable. It's three-day orbit. It has tides on the, on the planet, has tides on the star. And that star is gradually slowing down as it gives up its angular momentum to, to other material, to the magnetic field. And so now it's rotating slower than the rotation period of the planet. Now it's the planet's turn to give up angular momentum. And so what we're seeing are planets. They're now falling back into their star as they give up angular momentum. Clearly something that we'll want to uh, continue to monitor. Up to now, we've talked about stars. We've talked about a planet around a star. Let's think about our own solar system. It's not one planet around one star. It's many planets around one star, particularly if you decide whether uh, you're talking about small planets, minor planets like uh, Neptune, or not Neptune, but uh, Pluto. So here's a system 
one of our first systems that we found that's a multiple planet system orbiting the same star, showing us transits for all these planets. Six planets, but they're all very close together. If you project their orbits down on that, uh, the orbit of Venus, they're all inside the orbit of Venus. Venus is hotter than a pizza oven. You can melt lead in it. And five of these are inside the orbit of Mercury. Extremely hot. Now we know from our picture of the formation of a planetary system, if the planets form close to the star, they must be rocky. That's the only because they, they start refractory, they come, are composed of refractory material. Well, these planets are close, so close together, they interfere with one another a little bit in their orbits, and we can get the masses. Get the masses, get the size, get the density, and these aren't rocky. None of them are rocky. The innermost moon may have some rocky material, but it's got a lot of other material, gaseous material with it. So again, this is telling us our planetary system, our solar system, probably didn't form the way we thought it did. Because they, they should all be rocky, and they're not. What they're telling us is migration is going to be very important, probably for our system, the evolution of our system, as well as this system. Well, OK, we've looked at uh, single stars uh, with single planets, and single stars with multiple planets. Now it's time to look at the fact that most of the stars in our galaxies aren't single stars. They're multiple stars. Most of them are binary star systems. And so, do they have planets? Theory, uh, when I first started Ames, was no, they couldn't have planets, but of course, they do. Uh, <laughs> nature is much more complex than one might guess. Here's a planet orbiting a, bi uh, a pair of stars, a bright hot star and a small cool red star. Uh, that's uh, Luke Skywalker there uh, uh, and from Star Wars watching the sunset. Uh, the problem with this, this picture, there's several problems with this picture. One of which is, in reality, the bright star in a binary star system like that is always the white hot star, and the small one is always red. So in Star Wars, they made a factual error. They got the colors reversed. So when we discovered this, we called up George Lucas and said, look, you made a mistake. Uh, this can't be a fact. And, uh, he enjoyed the humor, and uh, we had a you know a, a news conference, and he sent out some of his team to to, to enjoy the, the announcement of this with us. But, but if we look at the numbers here, the numbers say the size is about eight times the size of, of Earth. This thing is nearly Jupiter. It's going to be a gas giant. People are not going to live on it, and even if they did live on it, uh, you notice the temperature is minus 126 Fahrenheit. That's as cold as it ever gets in Antarctica. It's not a place to grow up and, and, and do any farming. So this is not uh, Skywalker's home. We've got to continue to look at binary star systems to find his home. And um, by the way, uh, the first one that we just saw, let's just go back to that for a second. This system is Kepler-16b, called 16. First one that we've found planets around a binary star. And the person that discovered that is in the back of the room. Uh, well, you want to stand up, Lawrence? Okay. So he's a SETI member, and he, he found it. Don't want to miss that. It's wonderful to have these people here. They uh, make the, the uh, mission successful. Okay, this is the one that was discovered and announced yesterday uh, by a different group of people. It's another binary star system. Of course, the small one is red. Uh, what we've got here are two planets. Uh, one of which is got an orbital period of 50 days, another one of 303 days, not very far from the orbital period of the Earth. Uh, and it's, it's in the habitable zone. It's another planet in the habitable zone of its star. But again, it's somewhat large. It's about four times as large as that of the Earth. So it's probably going to have a lot of gas in it. May, probably not a rocky planet, but we're moving toward that. Yeah, month by month as we make more discoveries and confirm more of these. So uh, a really wonderful discovery uh, that uh, we announced yesterday. So the mission has been very successful up to now. It's been discovering all sorts of things, binary stars, planets around binary stars, multiple star systems, all sorts of uh, multiple planet systems. So what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about how the mission came about. What is required to build a mission? So those of you who want to build a mission, I think well, would be both encouraged and discouraged 
uh, to do so, because it's a lot of work. So let's start out with how the mission begins. And that is a little brief history, and you read the top thing, and it says 1971. That's quite a while ago. Uh, Rosenblatt, who was a, uh, uh, an AI person, uh, in 1971, wrote an article about how you might use photometry to find planets. And he did some quantitative studies. He was the first person not just to babble about it, but actually show quantitatively how, uh, what the numbers might be. Shortly thereafter, however, he went, on, uh, went canoeing, was involved in an accident, and drowned. So for 13 years, his idea laid fallow until Audrey Summers and I came to uh, uh, read the article and said, let's see if we can make a make this practical. Let's see if we can make this work. Because you know, nobody had done anything to better than a part per thousand, not even NIS, NIST. So it was going to be quite a chore. And we knew we were going to have an instrumentation development problem. And we also understood in the year following, uh, we published a paper with Jeff Scardell uh, that one of the biggest problems is going to be the stars themselves. They were going to be a variable. There were not going to be any constant stars and not at the precision of 10 parts per million. So we knew we had a, a big job ahead of us, and we started in 84 developing different photometers. At first, they were very small. You can see them here. These fit in the palm of your hand. There's three of them here. We're using quantum perfect silicon diodes, a concept that has not yet reached the public that much, but NAST has been pushing it for a long time. Uh, and they're the electronics that, that did that, and certainly enough, sure enough, we could indeed get uh, to very high precisions with these. We then uh, started using those in a big plate here. This big plate is 17 inches square. It fits in the back of one of the telescopes at Lick Observatory. The idea was to see if we could not just use it in the lab, but use it to look through the Earth's atmosphere and see at least Jupiter's. Now the difficulty is these detectors uh, need to be cooled. They operate in the uh, room temperature quite well, but the noise is high. And so we put them in this system, and we could see the stars, and you know, it would get some nice measurements. But we really wanted to cool them, get the noise down. So we put optical fibers from them into this uh, doer and kept them at liquid nitrogen temperatures. It was a fairly expensive uh, thing to do, especially when there was almost no money available. And it was a terrible flop. It was just the worst thing we ever built. Uh, the precision was about a thousand times worse than what we needed. I mean, we weren't even close. And so we're really puzzled about that. And the answer is the optical fibers let light through in modes. So a fiber will let a certain number of modes of light through. If you ever flex the fiber in any way, that number changes. It goes up one, it goes down a couple, whatever. So your precision isn't a part per thousand, it's one percent. So we managed to explore most of the uh, blind alleys and finally recognize that CCDs could be made to work. When we first tried them, they were pitiful. Uh, but you can make them work, and uh, we'll talk about that. So let's talk about 1992. We've been building these, the, the these systems. We've been trying photometers at various telescopes. In 1992, a big event happens. Uh, Wolshun and Frail find the first planetary system around a neutron star. The radio frequencies from it are changing, telling him there are planets there. Astounding. Again, nobody could have predicted this. A, a star blows up, destroys all of its planets, and now you find a bunch of planets. OK. But it was years after that, uh, and by the way, that was also the year that uh, this discovery program started. Up to then, NASA had two kinds of programs. It had the Explorer program for little spacecraft, and had the major things for the, the flagships that go to Mars and Titan and all sorts of places. There wasn't an intermediate mission. Wes Hunter said, Let's convince Congress to fund the discovery missions, which are intermediate missions. So in 1960, 19, uh, uh, that uh, there was a, a contest for uh, concepts to be funded. We proposed to that. Dave Koch joined the team at that time. He, w he and I put together a, a, our first science team uh, and proposed something called FreeCEP, Frequency of earth Size Inner Planets. And of course, it was rejected. And the statement was, well, nobody's ever built uh, shown that detectors have that kind of precision. So of course, it won't work. 1994, there was another announcement, now for an actual flight. And we again proposed. Uh, and this time they said, well, you know, you're proposing a telescope. 
We know what telescopes cost. They cost what a Hubble's cost, several billion dollars. And that's you know a factor of 10 or better than what's available. So your proposal is rejected. 1995, a year later, was the first discovery of a planet around an, an ordinary star, something like the sun. And that was by two Swiss investigators, uh, Didier Kilo and Michel Mayor, uh, and they published that in 1995. It was also the year that we published a paper showing that we could get CCDs to work properly. That is to say, when you make the measurement, it really looks bad. But if you look at the systematic errors CCDs have, and you measure them, you can correct them all out. And now your system will give you that 10 part per million precision that you need. So we published that. 1996 was the next announcement of opportunity for a Discovery class mission. Dave Koch, um, one of the mainstays of the mission, who really was a, a major fire, uh, spark plug in the mission, Carl Sagan, who was a member of the mission, Jill Tarter, who was here at SETI, got together and said, we don't like free set. It may be something you thought up, Bill, but we want a name change. And so we changed the name to Kepler, because Kepler was a very famous German scientist who lived about 1600. He was the person who developed the planetary laws, most that we use to calculate the properties of these planets. And he developed some of the uh, laws of optics. And of course, we use that in a telescope. So I was rather delighted, in fact, to change the name to Kepler. And we changed the name. We put the proposal in. And it got rejected anyhow. <laughs> they claimed that the problem was that nobody had ever done automated photometry. And certainly not automated photometry of thousands of stars. You did one star at a time. You point your telescope at star A, you move to star B, which was a comparison star, you compared the two, and you compared it to a reference star in case your comparison star was, was uh, variable. And that's how you went through the whole night doing one star at a time. And you didn't do it automated, you did it by hand. So they said, well, you, nobody's done it. Go do it. Build an observatory. And just show us you can do it. So we did. We built an observatory by going to Lick Observatory, finding a dome that was not being used, convincing Lick to let us use that, and uh, uh, building a, a, a photometer. And here is, is what it looked like. There's the dome. On the right-hand side, left-hand side, is our first telescope there. We built the telescope, designed the telescope, the mount. We actually had to replace the floor because the floor was so rotten. You could step through it. And the dome leaked, so we had to go on top of the dome and fix that, too. But, you know, it was good exercise. A nice thing to do on Saturdays. And this was a second telescope, a very fast system. And at first, it wasn't completely automated. It was later, but we had to have observers that would go there every night and actually keep the equipment running. This was one of our observers, Spock. And uh, like the real Spock, he had a rather disturbing personality. Uh, and particularly, he liked to chew through all the wires. So he was not necessarily a welcome observer. We, we, we published that work, we, we, we showed it could be done, you could do automated photometry, you could do that of Jupiter's, uh, and, we uh, and you saw the figure there that showed that we actually saw uh, some transits, and they said, okay, and the next time we, we proposed, they said, we agree, we, uh, you, we like your science, you showed the detectors work, you showed you can do automated photometry, but you've never shown you can do, uh, handle the on-orbit noise. Spacecraft in orbit, telescopes in orbit, aren't bolted to the ground, so they move. They have reaction wheels that hold them on the stars, and the reaction wheels jiggle. And the biggest error, biggest noise source on CCDs is the motion of your stars on those CCDs. So show that you can hold it so still, and show that you've got 10 parts per million photometry with the real noise. So go build a facility in the lab and show you can do 10 parts per million, and show that you can actually find those transits. So we did. They gave us half a million dollars, which was half of what we needed. You know, it would be great would have failed, so we borrowed the other half million. People like Dave Morrison here and others helped us get those funds from Ames so we could finish this facility, build the facility, and the facility is shown here. It's about 10 foot high uh, here, and at the bottom of it is this blue sphere. The blue sphere is a big light source, or really it's a reflector of other light sources. The light comes up through a plate where we've got thousands of holes drilled of various sizes that represent so the stars and our galaxy, big ones, small ones, bright ones, dim ones, close together ones, ones that are far apart, ones that interfere with one another. And then we measured, we, we then jiggled the telescope at the top with the power spectra, with the actual motion that the real telescope would have. 
because we designed the telescope already, that's what we proposed, and we knew what its power spectrum would be. We knew what wheel we were going to use, so we could calculate that, and we could impose those motions. And we found that we could handle that, but certainly the motion was very, very important. You could see this is the, these are the outputs of, I'm sorry, this is the motion that we've imposed, and this is the output of stars that should be perfectly constant. Actually, the ratio of one star to many stars. And you get very big changes. In fact, um, thousands of pixel motion gives you a 17 parts per million change in output. And we've got to be down to 10 parts per million. And that's why we have to control our pointing so well. We point, we point that telescope at least as well as Hubble does. And they spent millions in their guidance system. And we, we have a, one that's at least that good. And it works just beautifully. Okay, so we proposed again. We showed that we could do these things. Uh, we sent the proposal, the, uh, the results in. They reviewed that, and we proposed again in 2000, and the proposal was accepted for competition. What had just competed with 26 others, and the down select was the three. And so the following year, we were chosen among those three. There was two that were actually chosen. Dawn was the other one. Uh, and in 2001, we got started. Uh, we were to launch in 2006, but there were a lot of difficulties along the way. Just an enormous number of difficulties, things you could not imagine. That slowed us down. One of the year, we were halfway through the year. It was a year that we were buying all the parts, putting all these things together, spending millions. Spending a million a week is what we were spending at the time. And headquarters said, we're sorry. You're halfway through your year, but we have to cut your funding by 50%. So we fired everybody. Okay, that's all you can do. And next year you have to hire people again and train them. So that tends to delay your mission and make it a somewhat more expensive. So we had difficulties, but like most missions do, you overcome them. So it's not a surprise. It's something you sort of need to plan on if you're going to build a mission. You've got to be patient. 2009, we launch. We begin space operations. We were actually funding planetary transits before science operations began. Actually, during commission, we could actually begin to see uh, the transits. 2010, we have planets orbiting other stars. The first publications uh, occur. We're actually seeing the light from some of the planets. And some of the planets are so hot, we see the light from them. We can tell something about the atmospheres of some of these giant planets in short period orbits. So some really great publications coming out immediately. 2011, uh, for the first time, we're getting transit timing variations. We see the planets interacting with one another. We can now confirm them without radio velocity. We can confirm them just because their orbital times are jiggling around. We get the masses now, and we can get their densities and compositions. So a great leap forward there as well. And of course, the first circumbinary planet, the Lawrence, and the first planet in the habitable zone. Kepler, Kepler will accomplish this purpose. His purpose is sort of listed National Academy of Sciences. He said that one of the results of the Kepler, once the results of the Kepler mission are known, we can build the next mission. We'll, we'll know how to choose, because there's many different approaches you could use to advancing science. So we need to know, are Earths rare or frequent? Of course, if they're frequent, SETI needs to change its mode of operation and start transmitting and saying, hey guys, we're interested in talking. On the other hand, if they're rare, it's going to be a very expensive proposition to go and find Earths around other stars uh, for these new missions. So we need to talk about what you're going to do next after Kepler's finished. And so there's this list of missions that have been proposed. Probably the two that are most uh, likely are TESS and PLATO. TESS is a mission that has been proposed to NASA. It's being evaluated currently. We will know whether it will fly uh, probably this December. And it's going to look at all the stars that are close by. Not just like Kepler, which is a probe out into the galaxy to find statistics. This will look at all of them that are nearby, just the nearby stars. It may not be able to find Earth, or very many, but it finds planetary systems. And now you know what to point the next mission to. And that next mission is basically a mission that will look at the composition of atmospheres. Uh, one of the ways you can do it, there's things like occultors, coronagraphs, and interferometers. This is an example of a occultor. You have a space telescope in space, a place for it, uh, and you have several thousand miles away in a culture. That's just a great big disk with carefully, a careful, uh, clever fringe around it, about 30, 30 to 100 feet in diameter, several thousand miles away. And you point the telescope at the star here, and this disk is in the way. 
and it doesn't get light into your telescope, but you can look over the edge of the disk and you see what's near the star. You see the planets. And so for the first time, you can actually see the planets. And when you see the planets now, not just the light from the star, you can begin to analyze it and see what's in the atmosphere. So this is one example. Um, another example uh, that's been studied quite a, quite a bit here at Ames in particular is a really novel optical system. And the optical system is shown uh, here. Uh, you have a, a mirror, a lens, and the light's coming in uniform from, uh, from the star. And if you focus it in your telescope, whether you're an amateur or a professional, you get a bunch of rings. And these are the diffraction rings because the light hits the edges of the telescope, and there's a lot of light at the edges. But what is done in this coronagraphic system is that light comes down here in a big wide beam, hits this odd-shaped mirror, which focuses it into another really weird shaped mirror. In fact, that's the surface of a typical um, Schmidt corrector. And that again focuses it, and now the light beam looks like this. Very bright in the center, very dim on the outsides. So the diffraction pattern nearly disappears. And so your image now doesn't look like a bunch of rings, it looks like a nice little spot. And so if you have something like that, and you say, well, let's look at, say, Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, and it has a planet like Earth out at 1 AU, there it is. You can actually separate it from the light of the star. This blocking is the blocking that you do with the occulter. Here is Tau Ceti. Again, you can see the planet just sticking along the edge. And now you can get, that, get at that light and begin to say, what is what I'm going to do with that light? Uh, shown again. And the answer is, let's put it through a spectrometer and see what the spectra looks like. Here's the IR spectra of something, wavelength from uh, 5 microns, maybe 25 microns, brightness of that planet now, and probably photons per second. These things are really, really dim. You're talking about, you know, 24th, 26th magnitude objects. Very, very dim. Very few photons per second. But if you've got a nice smooth curve like this, when you take the, did those measurements, you'd be disappointed. That's a hot rock. It's not interesting. But what if it had a big gap here? Well, that gap tells you the CO that has an atmosphere. It's got CO2 in it. It's got another gap right here. That's saying that's got water. That's what you need for life, just those two things. Water and CO2, that's what plants need to live on. If they produce a lot of uh, 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 poison gases, to them at least, or oxygen, uh, you would see another little gap where you see ozone. That ozone uh, is not o oxygen, of course, but a photochemical energy exchanges with oxygen. It's a good marker for oxygen. It's the kind of atmosphere that would really excite you. There might very well be life here. This, in fact, of course, is the specter of the atmosphere of the Earth. So that's what you're, one of the things you're looking for. Another thing that you'd like to look for is do photometry. Here's the photometry you might be able to do. What we've got here is 24 hours, and if you look at the uh, reflectivity of that planet, you could see a little black line, and that would be the reflectivity of the Earth. It was a little dot. That's how it would change with time. And if it was a planet without ice, it would look very much like that. It would look very much like that, but it would have a little dip. If the planet was covered with ice, it would be the curve above it, the blue curve. The curve to the right says, well, what about it's a, a, a desert planet? Well, then you'd have the, uh, the violet curve. If it was a uh, ice cur, I can't read that there. It says it's a, a jungle planet. It would look like the green curve. In fact, doing the photometry over time, you could begin to tell something about these planets. So it would be a great breakthrough in our understanding, not only the frequency of these planets, but what their planets are like. Thank you. Bill, if I could uh, kick off the questions. Um, you uh, mentioned that uh, the possibility of having uh, one of those uh, large uh, uh, gas giants with, uh, with uh, satellites around it, mm -hmm. and the possibility that you might be able to find those with Kepler. What, what, what sort of light curve would you be looking for that would give that away? There are three methods that we're using to find moons around these giant planets. Uh, one of which is, you know when the giant planet transits? Shortly before, there could be a little dip. 
that would be the moon, or maybe shortly thereafter. So now you're beginning to look for a little dip that occurs before or after this. Now, it's not going to be a seven sigma signal. It's going to be a much smaller signal. But that's okay, because you're not searching 150,000 stars, so you don't need seven sigma events. Three sigma is fine. So that's one way. Another way is you look at the noise that you're measuring, because we measure the noise all the way along, all the time, to see what that level is. The noise just before the transit should be higher than it was before, because that moon is adding noise to our signal. So that's two of the methods. I forgot what the third is, but our, our team has got a, another method as well to look for these planets, or for these moons, and they are very active in doing it. They haven't found any yet. You mentioned the about a thousand plus uh, planet candidates that are still being investigated. I'm assuming many of those are farther out from their um, stars than the planets that you've confirmed already. I'm wondering if any of those candidates are circling Kepler 11 and might be um, additional planets in that system. Kepler 11, of course, was the, the, the image I showed where we had six planets orbiting one star, and the orbital periods were rather short. And you're getting at, well, couldn't there be planets further out? And the answer there is there certainly could be, and we, when, when a uh, star shows us planets like that, we don't stop observing it. We continue to observe it because you might very well be right, there certainly could be other planets around it as, as well. And we also do some work with radial velocity to see if any of those are massive enough to show us a radial velocity signature as well. Thank you for your oh. patience. Oh, no, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one was, um, uh, does the, uh, let me see, sorry, I'm losing. Uh, Oh, um, has it been considered that the uh, planet that's being uh, that's forming could um, uh, cause a particular distribution of the particle sizes within the uh, cloud that's surrounding it, and would it change as it's uh, as the planet grows in size? What you're saying really is you can imagine an accretion disk like this, or maybe it's a disk where planets have formed and and there've been asteroids and there's lots of dust around it and that dust distribution might look differently if there was a planet among that because it would scatter the material and it would change the distribution of light that you'd see. That's certainly be considered. Uh, it has been seen for Pictoris Beta and I believe one or two other stars where you see disks and so the belief is there may very well be planets that you're picking up there but they, they have not been able to get uh, a quantitative determination of what size that planet might be and, and so on. So it's certainly an active way of looking. And in fact, there are people, there are some stars, a few stars, where people are able to, uh, uh, in the infrared, actually see a planet in that disk. Now, people argue as to whether or not it really exists or not, but I think we're beginning to get the technology to actually see some of the planets that are out way beyond Pluto, far enough from their stars so you can actually see some of those as well. Then uh, the other question was, um, uh, how many pixels uh, does it take on your system to do combine to, uh, to form uh, an airy disk or to uh, a complete uh, uh, a light exposure for one star? Okay, uh, basically you, you want to, uh, what we try to do here is to put the stars on several pixels so it doesn't saturate quickly. Because that, of course, messes up the, the photometric measurement. Uh, the, there's a noise level that you're always seeing. So if the signal on any particular pixel is below the noise level, significantly below the noise level, we don't use that pixel. So we go to every star and say, oh, this is a really dim star. It only lights up one or two or three or four pixels so with a signal noise gra level greater than one. So we just store those four pixels, do our photometry on those. But if you've got a really bright star, then maybe use 10 pixels. But what if you've got uh, 61 Cygni? It's one of the stars that's in our field of view. It's a classical star people have looked at for 100 years. It's so bright, it saturates everything. The, the electrons pour down the columns. We just add up all the columns. So we, we give it 300 or 400 pixels. Add up all the electrons, and we do photometry with saturated stars 
but that's ra very rare. It has to be a very special star for us to put that many pixels on. So each star has a certain number of pixels associated with it that we have chosen based on its brightness and its interest to us. Yes? Going through the uh, graphs with those bar charts uh, of the uh, number of planets uh, versus total period, if we take the 1 over r dependence out of that as we go further away from the star, do we find anything interesting? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what you're finding is the actual distribution of planets with semi-major axis. The, um, the results, we, we've been plotting that, we've been publishing some of that, but I don't consider it very definitive. It, it looks like if you looked at the number of planets as a function of semi-major axis, that it, it's going down, it's getting smaller, the number getting smaller per AU. But people like to say, no, no, let's look at it logarithmically distributed. And that goes up as you go further out per logarithm of, of semi-major axis. One of the things that we're talking about, though, as you go further and further out, what do you see? We see the Jupiters, you see the Neptunes. Can you see the Earth? Well, if it's far, very far out, you don't see very many transits, which means the signal doesn't come out of the noise yet. And yet we know most of the planets are small ones, not big ones. So we're getting answers, but we don't think they're very definitive at this point. How did the cosmic radiation How do we have, uh, uh, handle cosmic rays on CCDs? That's a very, very important problem. They're always cosmic rays. There's no magnetic field of the Earth to protect you from it. So our CCDs are hit continuously by them. I think every pixel ultimately gets hit by them. They get damaged by them. Uh, they, they, they form pulses of electrons that go into the pixels that we, we have to look for and t take out. The proper, proper way to do that is to do that on board the spacecraft and watch every pixel every time there's a photograph, uh, image is taken. We could not afford that. We did not put that electronics aboard the spacecraft. We couldn't afford it. It was a trade. It's done on the ground. And what that means is you've got a 30-minute sum on, on each of your pixels. And so you can only find the biggest, biggest galactic cosmic rays. But in every image, we look at every pixel. And we look for the cosmic rays. And we compensate for them. We generally replace them by the average uh, before and after the cosmic ray. Now, we also, another thing that we did was during commissioning, you have the you have the shutter uh, shutter. You have the the telescope closed with a a, a a big sheet of metal, whatever it's called. It's closed, and so the answer is operate the spacecraft, look for stars. And of course, all you see are galactic cosmic rays. Right. You can see the very faint ones, the very low energy ones, and you can build that spectrum up. And we did that so we know what what we're looking for in terms of galactic cosmic rays. But they're always a problem. Okay, different question. Do you have good enough long-term stability to see the sun cycles of the suns? I know you are not looking long enough, but you know, sun, our sun has 11-year cycle. So do you think it will be possible to determine sun cycles of the other suns? The, uh, the mission, Dave Koch and I, uh, for years, used to go to NASA headquarters and, and talk about how this mission was the greatest thing you know, since life's bread. And they always said, you know, there aren't any planets around. You're not going to find anything. But astrophysics, what you're talking about, looking at the variability of stars, looking at the cycles. The sun goes through a maunder minimum. It has a cycle where the Earth's uh, climate gets very cold. Glaciers come down out of, out of, the, uh, uh, out of the, the mountains and cover the European farms and so on. And that happens about every uh, three or 400 years. Last time it happened was about 1,700. It's due, right? So why don't you do that? And the answer is, well, of course, we will do that as part of looking for planets. And so we do astrophysics. We have a lot of people that do astrophysics with this. We are looking for those cycles. Uh, Gibor Basri, I don't know if you know Gibor or not, but he studies cycles like that in M dwarfs. And so there's a very active program to do that. And we're hoping as the mission goes on longer and longer, we will do better in understanding these cycles for stars like the sun and maybe understand what causes the maunder minimum in our sun, because we don't know the answer to that. Bill, I've got two questions. Um, that last slide where you're doing diurnal and orbital photometry, how much do those models have to be cloud-free for you to get information? 
let's see, the cloud free models, there's a cloud free model here, is that right? <coughs> Cloud cloudless earth. So most of these, in fact, see cloudless earth, cloudless earth, cloudless earth, and here, uh, there's one of them that shows with clouds. If you have significant amount of clouds, clearly you, you tend to lose these curves. That's the simple way to say it. It's, if you've got clouds, you basically don't see the surface, you don't see these things. So uh, this is certainly not going to work all the time. I think that, in fact, this is one, what one hopes to be able to do in the future with some planets, but you're not going to be able to do this with all of them. And you think about doing photometry like this, we talked about photo photons per second. That's not watts per second or microwatts or nanowatts, this is photons. So to get curves like this is going to take an awful lot of integration for a long, long time. And one would hope that someday mankind will be able to build you know, these overwhelmingly large telescopes, the owls and things like that, and put them into orbit so that you can do this. But this is something that we all would like to see someday in the future if we live forever. <laughs> and and then since you were doing a little historical perspective, I'm trying to think back before the launch about how much the team appreciated the power of the TTVs. Did we really understand that or has that just been something we've, we've really learned since you had data? In the, uh, in the proposal, we put down that you could do that. I think it was one line because we weren't all that sure, but we put it down because we thought we might be able to do it. Uh, we put down a number of other things as well. So far, we've been able to do all of them. Yes, sir. What's the, um, what's, the length of, oh. what's the length of the primary mission? What's the length of the extended mission? And what is, in your wildest dreams, the longest mission you can possibly pull off? Okay. <laughs> The, uh, the mission was designed for four years. That generally tells you about the reliability of the components and things like that. Designed for four years. We were, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit over budget. So to punish us, they cut down to three and a half years. Uh, and that's what it was. It was an actual punishment. Uh, any case, I mean, because it doesn't change the physics. You've got to look four years to see four trances. To get high enough signal noise ratio, no matter what the dollars are, you've got to do that. And it turns out the stars are more variable than we expected. So if you're going to find Earth around stars like the Sun, you probably need closer to eight transits. You need to look for eight years, which is a, a surprise to us. The Sun seems to be unusually quiet. And we based the mission design on the Sun. So it was designed for four years, funded for three and a half. We went to headquarters and said, uh, the mission is, 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 we'd like to continue the mission uh, as an extended mission. And they put us in competition with the Hubble Space Telescope and several other things. Uh, and we were successful. They gave us funding for four more years, which means it will be seven and a half years, because uh, we've, we've flown three and a half at this point. Uh, and that's really, really great. Uh, is that what uh, we want? Of course not. It turns out that the longer you look, the higher the signal noise ratio, the, the more the small planets come out of the noise, the more you look in the habitable zone, the hot stars, which which has over the periods of three years or so, or four years, you explore more of the habitable zone of Earth. So we want to look longer. And the TTVs that Joe was mentioning, uh, which have turned out to be stunningly better than anybody could have guessed. It just worked superbly. And we thought it might work. But it worked very, very well. It turns out the benefit uh, of the mission goes as the time squared. So what we want to do is maximize the length of the mission. And we have fuel to go to 2019, possibly 2020. That's what we'd like to do. But that means, that means that since it's getting further and further away, we'll have to drop the number of targets. The target's very noisy, get rid of it. Uh, if you can convince headquarters to give us more DSN time, take more DSN time. Because that, you know, that's one of the things. You run a lower data rate, but you need more DSN time. And so you have to stop looking at these crazy rovers and things like that on Mars. <laughs> Bill, uh, if there's no more questions, we have a, uh, a special uh, Are We Alone mug. Uh, I think it's uh, appropriate, uh, given that you're going such a long way, to work out the answer to that question. Please uh, join me much. in thanking Bill for his great talk.